we now know that wind and solar are not free. It, 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 and it isn't just us saying it, it's the state saying it. $61 billion as a baseline start. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Power Gab, your go-to podcast for all things Colorado energy policy and politics. I'm Jake Fogelman, joined by my co-host, Amy Cook, coming to us from North Carolina. How are we doing this week, Amy? Uh, you know, living the dream here. Um, beautiful day. I've got the air conditioner going, a um, little warm, uh, but I thank God for fossil fuels that allows me to turn on my air conditioner and cool it down inside the hot, humid uh, uh, environment that is also the south and especially the south along the coast. Yeah, you guys are getting spring already while we're here using fossil fuels for our heaters because it decided <laughs> to take a nosedive in the temperatures this week. Um, but this week we wanted to uh, do a part, we're going to do a two-part series on this new report that just came out from the Colorado Energy Office. Part one is just going to be Amy and I chatting with some of the top line results, giving you guys some background information why this is going to be, I think, a very important study in Colorado politics moving forward. Um, and then next week, we'll actually have on some energy modelers who are going to be digging a little deeper into this study and doing some of their own analysis on it to see if, you know, as we suspect, there are some interesting things going on, some funny business going on in the results, which I'm, I'm sure we'll get into. Uh, but just some background for the listeners and the viewers. Uh, about six months ago or so, four or five months maybe, uh, at the end of the year last year, uh, an interim study of this leaked to Colorado news reporters. And you saw in the Colorado Sun and the Denver Post, all the big print news outlets, these big splashy headlines talking about interim results from the Colorado Energy Office suggests the state is on track to reach 99% carbon reductions by 2040 at no additional cost. And of course, you know, this was just a big, it had quotes from all the environmental groups about how great this was. And wow, I can't believe it's so easy and we're doing such a good job. Uh, why can't we go faster? Well, you know, fast forward till uh, last week, actually, as we're recording this, uh, unceremoniously, the final report just showed up on the Energy Office website. Uh, didn't see many splashy headlines this time around. And so when we actually took a look at the study to see maybe why that might be, it's because no additional cost turns out to be, well, for the cheapest scenario in the $43 billion range, and then for the wind, solar, and battery only scenario, which is the campaign promise of our current governor, 100% renewables, uh, it turns out to be quite expensive, uh, 60 plus billion dollars. So Amy, if you want to take away some of your uh, top line takeaways from the study, but that's, I think, a good place to jump off from that uh, maybe those headlines weren't quite so accurate. Yeah, I, I, and we have been saying this now for over a decade, that this was going to cost Coloradans a lot of money. Um, so I want to just, I just want to read this small, this is the first line under figure one, annual carbon emissions by scenario. And folks, I just want everybody to know, we do this so you don't have to. We read this stuff so, so you don't have to. But here's what it says. The key challenge in this transition revolves around reliably serving customers all hours of the year while reducing emissions and making energy prices more affordable and stable. Now, Jake, you and I just did a couple of shows on the fact that we don't have reliable power and that the latest wind event in Colorado showed that people went, um, Excel customers went without power and lost a lot of money. It's more than just an inconvenience. Now, in this case, so far, it's only money that has been lost. We have not had a loss of life like they have had in Texas. But they finally acknowledge some of the things we have been saying, that that this goal, remember the goal, which is 100% renewable power. So that's what it was originally, 100% renewable. 
Governor Polis ran on 100% renewable power, meaning wind, solar, and batteries. Um, and now he's saying 100% um, carbon free. They're looking at decarbonization. That's their, the, you know, the latest term everybody's using is decarbonization. And so the one that's the most expensive finds that wind, solar, and battery storage alone results in the most expensive path to decarbonization. Um, $61 billion, just real quick, doesn't include transmission lines, doesn't include utility profits. Um, they don't model for reliability. We actually looked at what their energy, their predicted um, oh, peak or, or their, their pick predicted total generation output could be and it and we're looking at that going that that math won't work but they come up with 61 billion with the b 61 billion dollars for colorado ratepayers now i think if you had said to coloradans we're going to move to 100% wind, solar, and batteries, and it's going to cost $61 billion. Have they been able to be honest about that? Because we have been asking this question since um, Governor Polis and then candidate Mike Johnston, um, since they campaigned for governor in 2018, we've been asking them, how much will this cost? How much will this cost? They never answered it. And finally, finally, we get their answer. Now we know it's without a whole bunch of costs like transmission lines, which are huge. Also, property taxes aren't in there. There, there there's a whole bunch of stuff that aren't that aren't included in that. But $61 billion, if you're talking about a, a, a state of almost six million people, um, you're looking at over ten thousand dollars for every man, woman, and child in the state. So I don't think if you'd asked a family of four. Would you? Well, I I don't think they would have agreed. A family of four would have agreed to a forty thousand dollar bill to transition transition from um, fossil fuel from reliable power to unreliable power, um, where we could we could go we could see multiple days without power. I, I just. To some extent, I give them credit for finally putting a number on it. It's a number that is incomplete. And it validates what we have been saying for 14, almost 15 years. Yeah, to your point, uh, one of our biggest critiques for the last few years has always been, you never told us the cost, you never told us the cost, you got these grand plans. So to some extent, I give them credit for actually coming out and saying, okay, fine, we'll try to show you our work and show us, show you what this is gonna cost and where this is going. Uh, but to your point, not including transmission costs is a pretty huge omission. In all, they, for context to the viewers, they modeled six different scenarios. All of them have uh, substantial portions of the electricity coming from wind and solar, which, uh, as our viewers should know by now, requires a lot of transmission uh, buildup to support because where the wind is good and where the sun is good for solar panels tends to be further away from population centers where power is used, uh, and that needs a lot of transmission. So the fact that they're not modeling those costs, which is one of the largest uh, increasing sources of costs in the power sector at the moment, is transmission line build-outs. I, I think you can say that these are quite conservative estimates for any of these scenarios. Um, but that being said, one other big thing is their, they, they call it their economic deployment scenario, which I think is their, I think it's safe to say the preferred scenario out of this modeling, at least what they think is the best route. It doesn't get to 100% carbon-free by 2040, so it's already falling short there. And it keeps uh, around 8,000, 8,200 megawatts of natural gas on the system. So it's another admission that you're going to need some fossil fuels if you want to keep the lights on. And I think they say it verbatim in the study that you know this was critical in uh, to include this in our future projected modeling for reliability reasons, which is another thing we've been saying for how long now that you, you're going to need dispatchable power. Right now, natural gas is the cheapest dispatchable power around. And the fact that you know 8,200 megawatts, for those that don't know, that's actually more natural gas capacity than we have right now, where we're mostly fossil fuels. So that's uh, right. pretty staggering that they say, actually, we're going to need more natural gas on the system than we currently have to make this work under the cheapest uh, so-called scenario. 
Yeah. And, and one of the things that I had brought up before, um, yeah, they, first of all, they do have that economic deployment <laughs> scenario where, by the way, we have to import power for that too. So we have to import power from other states. It's the only way that, that I, that that one, that that one's going to work. But, um, for instance, wind, solar, and batteries um, requires the largest build out of capacity at over 69,000 megawatts installed and barely meets reliability targets. Um, now, these are people who, now this is the Colorado Energy Office, but it is directed by, you know, Governor Polis appoints the head of the, of the Colorado Energy Office. I want someone to come out and explain why after they campaigned, after he campaigned on 100% wind and solar and batteries, we can barely meet a reliability target at 69,000 megawatts installed. And actually, I think the model that that um, our favorite energy modelers, our favorite energy models did, I think they came up with a they that we, that Colorado would need at least 118,000 in order to actually meet and have a reserve on um, for power. So that, because barely meets reliability targets, that's unacceptable. That's unacceptable. Yeah. And that's, I- And, so, and one so thing they missed on that, sorry to cut you Go off ahead. on this, Amy, but they, for, they didn't, uh, to their credit, they tried to build in increased demand from you know, building electrification, which is one of their big pushes, replacing natural gas heat and cooking. They tried to build in electric demand from uh, electric vehicles, which is also another one of their major pushes. But there was no discussion of AI and data centers, which if anyone's following the energy space these days is like the topic du jour. It's in all the national media outlets, power uh, balancing authorities and utilities across the country are freaking out right now about how they're going to be able to meet power just with their existing grids, with this uh, rapid influx of data centers that are coming. And so once again, you know, to give them, to be fair to them, all models are wrong. Some of them are, are interesting. This one's interesting, but <laughs> the, these big omissions right. are not telling you the full future uh, of what this is actually going to look like. I'll tell you, the, the you're, you're absolutely right, especially considering um, that there are legislators who want to go down this road and at the same time, incentivize data centers to come to Colorado when we can barely meet the load that we currently have. And, I, you know, one thing that I think is interesting, and it's certainly worth talking about at some point, is how I I, I hadn't thought about this until a couple of weeks ago when somebody um, talked to me about it, uh, is that we you can look at cryptocurrency mining as a way to, almost like storage, because if you build the load to to their specifications or to meet their demand, they're one of the first groups that can shut down and they will shut down and then release that power to to the grid. So it's almost like so you're you you build how many um you know megawatts to accommodate various crypto mining entity or um endeavors. And then when you need that power, they shut off and, and they're no longer dragging that power. They're actually giving it back. It's, so that it serves almost as storage. So the utility has a customer to serve with stored energy. And then they can pull that with, or they can, they have a customer to serve without just building additional capacity. There's a customer that is actually using it. But when there's a, a, a peak demand on the grid, then the crypto mining operations will shut down and that power becomes available. It's actually a pretty cool idea, but I don't see, um, I, I, I see it. <laughs> I saw the, the, the incentives for data centers, but I didn't see it for crypto mining. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that the crypto mining Texas does that pretty well currently. And, and you're right. That is a, yeah, an option. Do. But, um, but before, you know, I don't want to get too far into this uh, study because we want to save things for part two and we have our energy modelers on to talk about what they found digging through this. But what I will leave uh, the viewers and listeners with is why this study is important. You know, any old person can release a white paper, you know, why does it matter? Uh, because we've actually heard from policymakers and I've seen it reported in outlets like Utility Dive that 
The plan is to use this study as uh, support potentially for a policy push to perhaps accelerate our transition, our quote unquote transition, accelerate our greenhouse gas reduction targets. Um, I haven't heard anything concrete yet from the Polis administration or the governor's office, but I've certainly seen lawmakers and environmental advocates talking about, well, we've, now we've got the, the data that can support our, our drive to decarbonize and why aren't we going faster? So this matters. Um, it matters that this is incomplete and imperfect and it's still going to be informing policy. It very much uh, will be, I think, pertinent going forward. Um, but with that, I wanna kick it over to you for the, the main takeaways for this episode for our viewers and to get them ready for part two. Um, yeah, so uh, we now know that wind and solar are not free. It, 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 and it isn't just us saying it, it's the state saying it. $61 billion as a baseline start for wind, solar, and batteries. But even, even the lower level, um, even the, the, the lower costs, are, it's going to be a lot of money. So there's going to be costs. So here's, we've now been validated that we know wind and solar aren't free. We also know this is gonna be really expensive. And three, it's likely we're not gonna meet reliability targets. So get a generator. As always, sage advice. Uh, viewers, please stay tuned for part two as we dig a little deeper into this study. As we said, it's gonna be very important moving forward. Uh, but until that time, if you like what we're doing here, please uh, you know, like and subscribe to this video. If you're watching on YouTube, head on over to IITV on YouTube if you want to keep up with the video episodes. If you prefer audio, you can check us out on Spotify, iTunes, wherever you get your podcasts. And if you want to contribute uh, future show ideas or suggest guests or topics, uh, please email us at info at PowerGab. We love to hear from our listeners. Uh, but until next time, we'll see you.